bloke in a bar. What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to an episode of Bloke in a Bar. So with the new year coming, we'll uh, be doing more of these episodes where we talk all things footy. I actually used to do quite a bit of it um, for years, actually. And then I opened the bar and we're doing some at the bar and then uh, just didn't have the time to do it and was focused more on the, the pictures and that on Instagram. But I'm here with uh, Clarky, Clarky's NRL column or Car- Clarky's Rugby League column. Be careful, mate. Be careful. <laughs> How you been, brother? Yeah, pretty good, brother. Thanks for having me on. And so we're here to talk all things footy. I guess we'll get straight into it. Uh, Valentine Holmes, back in the NRL. What are your thoughts? First, I go straight to my Maroons. I'm, yep. Obviously, we're both Queenslanders. Mm-hmm. It's huge for us. And I think a lot of people have concerns over the six-year deal. And a lot of people go, oh, he's a winger, he's not a fullback. But you think back, that was the narrative at the start of that year. But by the end of the year, for me, I think he was a top five fullback. Oh, easily. There were even talks like, would he or Pong get the... Queensland right. fullback position mm-hmm. the next year that like again people have very not short memories but they seem to just get caught up in current news cycles but he was one of the best fullbacks in the game had some of the, he had the most line breaks mm-hmm. in the NRL he was one of the top try scorers in the NRL at the Sharks and I think they came like fifth or something that year so it's not like yeah. they had this crazy year um, so to think that he doesn't have the skill set to play fullback is insane especially when he's still 24 for me I 20, mean yeah 25 I think 25 yeah I mean if anything, this experience overseas will just teach him a little bit more professionalism and a different side of sports. Yeah, his you know his body hasn't blown out. He's not didn't come back jacked up with any drastic changes. To me, it's I think he'll slot straight back in. Yeah, but absolutely. I don't with see you, any issue. No, nah, not at all. And if someone's like, "Oh, it's going to take this long to get his match fitness back," it's like, mate, he's been playing this game his entire life. Right. And the biggest difference between him and Hayne is Hayne came back mid season, so he missed that whole preseason of fitness. Whereas Valentine Holmes is going to be up in town, so it's going to be hot as shit. Yep. He's going to be doing a full preseason with his team, the spine. And also, like, Jared Hayne, for his incredible ability, one of the best to ever play mm. the game on his day, he, he had the issues of, like, coming in and out of seasons before he left the NFL. Definitely. Valentine's Holmes has never had that. He's always no. delivered at a standard where effort his effort is high. Yeah. Whereas Hayne, because he's so fucking gifted, sometimes he would slip in and out of games and he would, sl- some years he'd be okay. Mm-hmm. The next year he'd be fucking unbelievable, which is, it's footy. It's so hard to stay at that high level. Whereas Valentine Holmes' effort, effort has never been an issue. He's never had an issue with weight. Fitness has never been an issue for Valentine Holmes. Like he's a genuine, um, you know, maybe Jared Hayne maybe has more natural ability fully, yeah. footy wise, but you look at um, Holmes' training ability and I would say that his training ability would be higher than Haynes, maybe because Haynes has it so easy because he's so fucking good. Yeah. Well, you look at 2009 and 2014 when Haynes won the Dally M's, his other seasons didn't really match up to that. They were just incredible seasons. Yep. That we pro- Like 2009, we might never see a season like that yep. again. There's a couple similar ones, Tedesco, Barber, 2012, yep. but I would we give, might I never would give, see it. I would give... I mean, we may as well just get straight into it. I would honestly... Like, don't get me wrong. Haynes was fucking crazy. Yeah. Incredible. Like, I, you, you cannot... But I just think like, yes, the Roosters side squad was most likely better. But the match winner in New South Wales origin and a grand final, like to be yeah. that clutch, like I think that that brings the scales back up of like, yes, the Eel squad wasn't as good, but like the match winner. They're different players though as well because mm. everything around the Eels revolved on like on Hayne. Yeah. Whereas you've got the Roosters, Tedesco... He wasn't the one that set up that try to win the grand final, no. but he's just always in the right place at the right time. Yep. He, it's so tough to compare them. But I mean, we've got to include 2012 Ben Barber in that conversation as well. I, but I just think that like, okay, New South Wales probably don't win both series without Tedesco. Yep. Roosters probably don't win the grand final without yeah. Tedesco. So like, it's like people say, oh, well, he had a better squad and everything like that. Mm. But in saying that the squads he was in probably wouldn't have won if he wasn't playing. Whereas, like, right. when you look at Barber and... and the, the tough thing for Hayne is they lost to a fucking over-the-cap storm. Yeah. So he could have gone on and done, did what Tedesco did, and that, like, seals it. Like, you know, he yeah. came out, won the grand final, whatever. But I just think, like, if you were looking at just their performances, maybe Hayne had better, like, single performances. In saying that, Teddy had some fucking crazy ones. Yeah. But I'm thinking, like, what's the end goal? It's to win a grand final, right. win origin. He went back-to-back in both. Yeah. I think Teddy has just made freaky shit normal yeah like 200 meters a game three line breaks a game crazy. 10 tackle breaks that's not normal no, you're right. but he no. has made it normal to where i you know you check the stat sheet and you're expecting it from him yeah yeah usually oh, absolutely. like when he does 180 meters you're like mm, quiet game yeah yeah quiet game yeah, yeah. <laughs> any other like you, 
you know, any other fullback, you're happy with 120, 130 mark. It's like he just does freaky shit that often yep. that it's just normal and we expect it from him. I think, I think if you go individual performances, like as in like some of the crazy shit they did in a game, you'd, I, would get, I would lean with Hain. Right. But if you're looking at like... The whole picture. The whole picture. Back-to-back origin and back and back to back uh, roosters. Yeah. And in both sides, they probably wouldn't have won without him. Yeah. It's like, fuck, how can you not say that's like one of the greatest mm. ever, if not the greatest ever? Yeah. Oh, you know, and one thing I'm actually really happy with, I tipped him to win the Daly M. Oh, really? So I didn't get too much right um, yep. with my predictions, but I said, look, 2018, he had that little adjustment period where he come to the yep. roosters. I predicted he would hit his stride in 2019 and just yep. have a marvelous season and... Can't really argue with it. He was pretty flawless. So, but is yours Hayne? If you had to choose Hayne, I'm biased because Hayne was my favourite player. No, you can say Hayne. Nothing wrong with saying Hayne. Nothing wrong with saying Hayne. Or Barber, Barber for that matter. Or Kempo Eight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see up, see up. Um, I'll go. Yeah, I'll go Hayne 2009. Hayne 2009. Yeah, that, that's that's probably brilliant. my best ever individual season I've witnessed. I watched his highlights a bit ago, and I was just like. He was just doing some insane stuff. Well, although we can argue that the Blues might not have won back to back, and Roosters wouldn't have won back to back without Tedesco, think where the Eels would have been without Hayne. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Probably totally. a wooden spoon, to be honest. Totally. Totally. Um, well, I don't know about wooden spoon. Like it's a bit harsh on the boys, but um, okay, they 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 wouldn't have reached a grand final. No. I don't believe. I think the big a big indi- a big factor here is the fact that Storm were over the cap. Yeah. And that like just. If they're not over the cap, Eels probably win that game. Yeah. And it's just like far out. Like then you just cement him in like the, the best run you've ever seen from a fullback. You said meant it. He won the grand final. Yeah. He got the job done. Um, but anyway, the, either way, I, I think like what's bizarre is you still wouldn't consider them the greatest fullbacks ever. You consider Billy Slater, Darren Lockyer yeah. because of their consistency. Consistency. Um, but Tedesco's heading that way. Yeah, definitely. Would I, you... I've... Would you would you start having the conversations of Tedesco as the greatest ever? Do you think he should be in the conversation yet? I think he needs another two seasons, not like barnstormers like we've seen, but consistently. And then I think that there's a genuine case that he could catch up to Billy Slater as the best of this era. Yep. It's hard to compare areas of rugby league. Like you go like, like oh, well, you know, who's the best prop? You think of Webkey. Well, Webkey's yep. an absolute, like, you know, he would a weapon. Yep. But then, you know, this era we're looking at Payne Haas. It's yep. a different... Front row. Then you go back 50 years, Arthur Beetson. I think when we talk about like the goat of NRL and of certain things, we sort of, you've got to class it into errors. Yeah. It's impossible uh, to do it overall. But then like, it's just semantics. Like you're sitting here for fucking two years going, all right, this era. And then who was in this era? Yeah, era? yeah. That's like, I think everyone kind of, any reasonable person knows, like I'm not sitting here saying like, he's absolutely the goat and like nothing is going to change right. my mind. And like in any era, he would have been the fucking best or whatever. Yeah. But I just think like with the information you've got and the conversation you want to have mm. and the expression of like, if you you could put semantics into anything, you know, like you could go through the Hain season and the Tesco yeah. season and you could just break it all down. But I think it's more just like, you know, in your opinion, you think that this is the greatest ever from what you've experienced right. with rugby league. Who um, would your top three of all time be? Darren Lockyer, number one. I'd have Lockyer in my top three, yeah. He's, he's number one, most consistent ever, easy. Um, and he did it. He was arguably the greatest ever in two different positions. There's not a single person yeah, that's done that. Absolutely. Agree. Um, and he and he did everything. Won grand finals, yep. multiple grand finals. Was it Origins. Two thousand and six. He won premiership, golden boot, four nations, and Origin. Yeah. Like that's. And, and he, he, ca- he was captain of all. I think. Yeah. And he didn't win a Daly M. <laughs> oh, Never won a Daly M. What a insane. Deal. Um, Andrew Johns. Yep, he's in there for me as well. I think we all know who number three has to be as well. <sighs> It's tough to leave JT out, but it's got to be Cameron Smith, right? Yeah. It's tough. It's so tough. It's it's just tough. Like You could put Cameron Smith there. You could put Thurston there. You could put Brad Fittler there. Yeah. You could put forwards there. Yeah. Um, the, the hard thing with the, the Cameron Smith is like, he's the greatest hooker ever, period. Mm-hmm. But because like you can't see the impact they have as well as you can see a half's impact, mm-hmm. it's really hard to judge. Like, you know, right. like, when you see Thurston's impact, you can see because he's running that team and you see everything he's doing. Whereas a, a hooker is so like subtle in how they control a game. But, he, but yeah. he absolutely controls the game better than any half ever has from hooker. Better than any half ever controls absolutely. the game. Absolutely. The way he comes out, holds the markers every time, holds the A defenders tight. Better than, he controls the game better than Andrew Johns. 
Look, I can't confidently say that. <laughs> look, I can say as a kid, I went for the Knights because of Andrew Johns, but yeah. I was quite young when he was yeah. in his heyday. Fuck, okay, well, I'll, for that reason, I'll, I'll rephrase. From anyone I've properly seen. Yeah, properly seen, yeah. I mean, Cameron Smith's definitely the, one of the goats. Yeah, if you had him top three, absolutely. It's yeah. just, it's, it's hard. Once you get into like, I've, I've got my like set, like I reckon Darren Lockett, Andrew Johns, like they're two yeah. chalk and duck form, best in the, ever. Yeah. Um, but it, when you start getting into third and fourth and you're like, look at like, I don't know, Sterlo and fucking all yeah. those people. Alfie Langer. Greg Kenny. Well, Alfie Langer actually has won more comps and his, his stats record's are actually better crazy, than Joey Johns. Crazy. Um, but anyway, we digress. Um, okay, so with Valentine Holmes, so you got obviously got Scott Drinkwater, Scott Drinkwater, yeah. water, um, Clifford, mm-hmm. Morgan. How do you fit them all together? Well, I think Morgan definitely, based on what we saw in 2017, yeah. needs to be the dominant half. So he, he's there at seven. And on, I think Scott Drinkwater has too much potential, even though I've only seen 10 NRL games from him. He was actually a 5'8 coming all through the grades, I believe. Yep. And I think it was about the under-20s, maybe a bit younger mark. The Storm decided to mould him into a, a fullback based on the fact they had Billy Slater there and yep. that he was the perfect, obviously, role model for that to occur. Yep. Can he transition back to a 5'8 in one preseason? Probably not, but I don't think he needs to be a, a dominant 5'8 like a Cameron Munster or Luke Keery. I think he can be a role player, mm. short, short kicking game. What take about a bit Clifford of though? Cliff, Clifford is relatively young. Well, I, I, I see Clifford as the potential to be the controlling half. Mm. And I think that if he's playing second fiddle to Michael Morgan, that will affect his progression. I think he almost gets more out of playing the dominant half in reserve grade. Okay. What about uh, Clifford at 14? Can he play hooker? He's relatively big. But the problem is, I think Reese Robson will fill that 14. Yep. He's a gun. Yep. I interviewed um, Darren Nichols, the uh, Dragons halfback, uh, about a year ago, and I said, you know, you obviously play with a lot of young guns in that reserve grade team this yep. year. Who's got the biggest future? Zero hesitation. It's Reese Robson. Yep. And, and, he's, um, and he, he's a hooker? He's a hooker. And yep. I, I would not be surprised if he puts a ton of pressure on the Granville this year. Well, I think that you, you could even argue that he may start the year. You know, I, I feel like yeah. other than Morgan and maybe Holmes and a few of their forwards, there's not really anyone guaranteed. Like, you've got like the international forwards. You've got Maguire. He's a lot. Isan um, Master, Masters, yep. Holmes, um, Felt. Like they're probably cemented. But McLean, Tamalolo, yeah, so, Cooper. So they're they're like cemented. But I think when you're looking at like their nine, their six. Mm. One of their wing positions, maybe. I'm trying to think who their winger is. Yeah, it's, probably Murray Tuolangi. He's only played a handful of games. But the, the thing with the problem with the dra- the the Cowboys is, is they've gone so poorly the last two seasons. No one's position should really be safe. Technically, no. Nah. When you when you look at it, like who's really earned the like? Yeah. Like yes, they have earned the right. These guys are fucking internationals or whatever. Yep. But from a club's perspective, as to what is you know, have they earned the right for a guaranteed spot? In 2020, with mm-hmm. the way they've gone two years in a row, not just one year in a row. Yeah. So it's interesting to see what they do with that. Do they just go, mm. we're going to be loyal to these boys, or do they go, you know? I think that was their issue. Mm. I think Paul Green, he had the full support of the locker room, but in a sense that was because, you know, the players loved him. But I think the players might have got a little bit too comfortable after that grand final. I can't... I mean, has there ever really been a case in NRL history where two of the greatest players, JT and Matt Scott, have come, uh, two players of their caliber, come back into a side... And they've gone from a grand final to missing the eight. That's crazy. I don't, I don't know. I just think the players got a little bit too comfortable. There wasn't those young guns pressing for the spots. Oh, well, I could be completely wrong. It's, yeah. it's literally just a guess. Because no, it, no, because if you knew, you would fucking fix it. it yeah. It's bizarre. Yeah, yeah. To make a grand final without JT and Matt Scott and go backwards for two years. Yeah, Cowboys is a very strange situation. I'm sure there's a lot going on behind the scenes that we don't know. But I do think... That, I mean, I still believe Michael Morgan's one of the most valuable players in the competition. He's just struggled the last year or two. Yeah. Um, so, if you had to... you know, Do you think they'll make the eight or not, really? I think they do. Do you they, think they'll they, make that? I think that team is too good to miss the eight three years in a row. Yep. Michael Morgan, full preseason, no little niggling injuries. If he comes back and he's the Morgan we know, mm. then there's no reason why a forward pack that has Cooper... McLean, Maguire, Tama Lolo. There's no reason... Even Cohen Hess, a little bit out of form, but we know what he's capable of. Yep. There's no reason why a forward pack like that can't lay the platform. And then it goes back to Scott Drinkwater. I think with his running game, he is the perfect 5'8 for Michael Morgan. Yep. Morgo controls the show. Scott pops up where he's required in that back line. Yep. Your Isan Masters out wide. Yep. Really good. And another player that is heavily underrated, Kyle Felt. 
He was he's, injured for a lot of last year. Yep. Yeah, yeah he's he came a, back and he finished as their top try scorer. Yep. And he only played a couple games. Like Yeah, he's um he's a gun. I rate him. He's honestly one of the most clutch wingers in the game. Yeah. And he's got the most clutch finishes out of any current winger in my opinion. <laughs> I'm sure you don't like it, but you think back to the 20 what's yeah. the 2015 grand final. Clutch finish. He's done it so many times. Like so many times clutch finishes. The balls on that bloke to put the ball down with one hand in a girl. Oh. Wish he had adopted. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god! Well, then Ben, we would have never seen Ben Hunt drop it, so it would have been another yeah. cr- rugby league. Just is the craziest, crazy, game, isn't crazy. It? <laughs> yes. Um, so I guess the Troy Mitchell situation. I, we both don't talk about this because it's like we don't want to add fuel to the fire. Yeah, but I'm, I guess oh, just, I'm guilty of chatting about it to some extent. Yep. But I've since spoken to Latrell, clarified what I know. What I know is what I know, and that's subsequently why I've stopped talking about it all yeah it's crazy how you know you speak to Latrell the person that actually knows what's going on yeah. and you're kind of like oh my I can't believe how much misinformation is out there mm-hmm. um, but I guess from the perspective of where do you think suits him like there has been I guess implications from the Roosters that they would like to move him on yeah um, now the dogs are apparently uh, sorry the Tigers are apparently mm-hmm. open to it it was just a story today with Moylan apparently not going to the Tigers yeah. or whatever I don't want to get into speculation of, of I guess, like, or oh, this pl- this club's pulled this contract or not pulled this contract is interested. But, you know, what we do know for a fact is the mm. Titans are definitely interested. Yeah. Mel Meninger has come out and quoted and said mm-hmm. that. Um, apparently, he's visiting them. W- what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that's a good or a bad thing for a guy like Luttrell? A move to the Titans? Mm. I think it's bad in the fact that Luttrell Mitchell's the sort of player that needs to be brought into the game by another player. Mm. You look at Luke Keary. Luttrell... Now, there's a notion he's a lazy player. I definitely don't agree with that. He's an impact player. But to be an impact player, you need to be brought into the game by someone. Do the Titans have that player to bring Latrell into the game? Maybe not. Yeah, I mean... And also, I guess if he wants to play fullback, Brimson just re-signed as well. And, and Brimo was so keen on that fullback spot. So it's like, okay, well, you know, maybe Brimson goes six and Taylor half. and Yeah. It's a tough one because, you know, he... he I think if he played fullback, he could have that impact. But that's something yeah. you're never going to have that impact. Like People think he can't play fullback. He came into the NRL as like an 18-year-old playing fullback. I think it was the year after Minicello retired. 14 then, tries in his debut year. And then fullback. Fullback. And his highlights are... Crazy. In, like, it was. It was Greg Inglis. Yeah. I, know he, I know he hates the comparisons and people are probably over him. That was Greg Inglis as an 18-year-old again. Yeah. The way, the strength and his balance to just yeah. push someone off at full sprint and not lose, it's incredible. It's he, he's a freak athlete. Yep. He could play front row. If he, if he, he really, really wanted to, he could he play really front could. row. So I guess, where do, you, where do you see him? Where do you where do you hope he goes? Where do you think it's best for him as a player? I'd, I'd love to see him go to the Titans. Yep. It, for me, it depends on whether he wants to play fullback or not. Yep. If he wants to play fullback, then we've got to rule out the Roosters. Yep. He can't stay with Tedesco there. Tigers is definitely a great fit, yep. it, you know, because Corey Thompson is their fullback at the moment, and he might not like it, but he is a fantastic winger also. Yeah. He can slot straight back onto that wing, and you have someone like the Chell Mitchell at the back. Other option, a little bit left field, Justin Hodges spoke to him and wanted to get him to the uh, Broncos, Broncos yeah. but they didn't have the salary cap. He comes off contract at the end of this year. Jack Bird has a player option in 2021. If Jack Bird doesn't activate that option, there is a million dollars spare there. They could bring Latrell in. Yep. That would be a really interesting one of Latrell Mitchell oh. joining that Broncos team. Fuck, I would love that the shit. The X Factor. Yep. What about the Storm? Yeah, definitely. I it's mean, like they've, they've, Scott's gone. Yep. Vunavalu's gone. Adokar rumoured. I mean, I don't know what the fuck's going on with that. Whether first it was, he, that. yeah. First he was going, then the CEO didn't actually say he wasn't going, but said we're on Adokar's side. And then there's another story saying it's D-Day for Adokar. Yeah. But, um... I mean, Melbourne Storm would be crazy. And if there's any coach that could whip oh, Latrell Mitchell fuck. into a discipline machine, and have we seen him do it with someone before? Yes, we saw him do it with Greg Inglis. Yeah. So there's absolutely evidence to suggest he'll do it with Latrell. Mm. He slots straight into that team. And another thing people might be not necessarily considering, they lose Cameron Smith, they lose a goal kicker. Yeah, Latrell comes in, there's your goal kicker sorted. I mean, I'm sure the cheese could kick. Oh, he's acting. He could, he could do it all. <laughs> Mate, of course the cheese would kick if he had to. Um, no, you're totally right. I mean, I think that... I think this whole notion, this media spin of like... 
clubs are pulling out and pulling these off. It's like, man, shut the fuck. Oh. Latrell comes out and plays the way Latrell can. Every club in the NRL is going to be interested in him. Like, oh, shut up with that nonsense. It's, like, It's not even a story when they say, oh, he, this club's interested. Duh. Yeah, duh. It's Latrell Mitchell. Like, <laughs> yeah. what are you talking about? And like, this, there's just some of the language that they use with him with like, like snubbed an offer and sick and tired of waiting around. Like, the clubs right. that... Like this, this is intentional language to put paint Latrell in a negative light. In a negative light, when yeah. Latrell has literally done nothing, like he's literally just doing what he's supposed to do. In reality, if the papers could make as much money off saying the Roosters are disloyal, they would. They would. We never hear, no. we never hear about a club being disloyal. It's always a player. Yeah. Because that attracts more interest. But in, in in reality, here the Roosters are the ones being disloyal. He's done nothing wrong. He's off contract. He can talk to other teams. Why are the Roosters pulling their offer? Mm. I mean, I understand it. they're a business. They might need to make other re-signings and stuff. Well, I just, I think, I think you're correct in saying that the Roosters haven't been loyal to Latrell. I just think that they're being loyal to their what they want, and what they want mm. is we need an answer. You didn't give an answer. We're pulling the contract, and we're going to sign. Blah blah blah. And yep. so, like from their perspective, they're they're just trying to find a direction to go in. Yeah. And then from Latrell's perspective, he's like, well, hang on a sec. Like, you know, what's it doing? Like, I fucking mm. just said I needed more time. Anyway, it's whatever. Um, it's it's interesting, man. It's, it's it's crazy to think what he's been through this year when you really sit down and yeah. think about it. Like when he, I don't think a lot of people actually know this. It's not necessarily out there. When he was dropped from the Origin, he was going through racial abuse. When he got into a fight in a pub in Taree, people were racially abusing his family, and then they came at him. Yep. And the media this year has constantly tried to drag a twenty-two-year-old like star down and his he shone bright regardless i mean yeah he might have got dropped from origin but every four every like drop down is a chance for a comeback whatever that yep. saying is and he came back into the australian side and with a premiership yeah and to think like that a 22 year old has gone through all this he, he's matured beyond his years and he has gone through more than anyone should have to go through in their whole life yeah in one year it's absolutely crazy and you know why aren't the media jumping on that to support him? Yeah, I just I understand speculation. That's fine, but I think the intentional uh, to p- position him as the bad guy. Yeah, the, the language that they're using, mm-hmm. the headlines that they're using, it's just it's at some point there's got to be like, hang on, what's this kid been through this year? Uh, and Let's when you read enough, it, it sort of subconsciously persuade persuades yeah. people to have an opinion. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, journalists are the best at it, and. I think they write words. They they exactly. use words to their advantage. Like and, spot on. Um, anyway, it's just it's one of those things where it's just the way it is at the moment. Hopefully, it'll change. I, th- I think it will change in the sense that like people will obviously start getting the media from people that aren't going to do that. Um, okay, so speaking of New South Wales, do you think they've won two in a row? And mm-hmm. it doesn't look there's there's no. They've got youth on their side. Mm-hmm. They've done it with arguably um, halves that have struggled for form but still got the job done. So it's not like it's been easy where they've just got this gun side and yeah. just rolled over Queensland. Um, and it seems like they'll only improve each year. And, and I guess the question would be, can they build a dynasty? Three years in a row, all of a sudden... You know, let's say they win again. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's like, fuck me. Three in a row, confidence is rattled. Who's our halves for Queensland? Mm. Can they do it? They're in the initial phases of it, but I think Queensland will break through. Uh, it might not be next year. It might be the year after. I can pretty confidently say I don't think they'll get eight in a row. Oh, yeah. That I mean, Maroon side was... Well, I just more mean a dominant period. Like dominant four, period? Yeah. Five years? Yeah, four or five years. Four, could sure. they do that? I think I can see that happening, but I can't see anyone ever doing eight in a row again. Eight's crazy. I honestly think we will look back at that Queensland side as the greatest potentially rugby league team to ever play. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Not even, not even a question in my opinion. Okay, so you, you genuinely believe that they could go on a trot of four or five years? Definitely. They've got better depth. They've got younger talent coming through as opposed to the Maroons. Everything is in place for the, for the Blues to have a successful period. And for the Maroons, there's still like whilst we did win the one game, I think last year, there's still a lot of question marks. Is Kevin Walters the coach moving forward? Who's the fullback next year? Is it Ponga? Is it is it Holmes? I'd, I'd, I'd assume it would be Ponga. I would definitely assume so. Ponga, yeah, Put Given, Holmes is incredible on the wing as well. Exactly, but there's there's definitely a lot more question marks over the Maroons than there are the Blues. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I think that uh, the Blues, you look at their key positions. You know, Tedesco's in 
Yeah. You know, unbel- Best like, fullback in the world. Greatest ever potentially form. Yeah. You got Cook, who's in un- incredible form. Luke Keery hasn't even debuted for him yet. Exactly. Luke Keery hasn't even debuted, and he's incredible. Like they, you've got guys in those key positions that are ha- like you know Mitchell Moses is playing incredible. Right. There's Cleary so many is young. Around their spine. You know, Cleary does a job. He does what he needs to do. So yep. maybe he'll be perfect for for Keery. Um, yep. Maybe you know, Latrell comes back in. Jack White and plays six. Kiri plays seven. Exactly. They got so many options of mm. guys playing good footy. Whereas you look at like, um, you know, Munster is playing really good footy and has yep. been for a while now. But it's like, and you got Cherry Evans as well that's been playing good footy at club. But it just seems that they're still trying to click. Like they haven't got that. They there's something they're not just clicking yet. Yeah. And so there's that question of like, okay, well, wh- you know, where do we go from here? Because right. it doesn't seem to be clicking when both players are playing really well. Whereas you look at the New South Wales side and there doesn't seem to be that not clicking, even though they're not playing. You, you would argue that like form-wise, Kira didn't play, but form-wise, you, you, you would say Munster and Cherry Evans had a better year than Cleary last year. Yep. And yet you didn't sense that disconnect from the halves of East New South Wales? Yeah. I, I think Queensland definitely have the halves and the spine in place, but they just lack a little bit of strike out wide. They did, they, I thought they did last year. Yep. Particularly, you look at the games Ponga was there. They, we were so over-reliant on him to spark our opportunities. Well, he was pretty much the reason we won game one. Yeah. He, oh, yeah, he definitely was. But then, you know, you look at the Blues, you had Jack White, who's not even a bloody centre, came in. Travojevic. Oh, Travojevic, the hat trick. Like, like their back line, Travojevic, Ferguson, Addo Carr... Whiten, mm. Tedesco, all in, in career best form. Yeah, and then you know Latrell Mitchell's not even included in that. Yeah, exactly. Like, when he when he's in career best form, he's literally better than all of them. Yeah, it's crazy. It's scary how much depth they have. So yeah, I'll definitely say four or five years they could do it. But I don't see anyone ever doing eight again. We'll, I think Queensland will break through at some stage. Yeah, I, I agree. I think we do have some good youth coming forward. What about the uh, the Sharks? Obviously, Jesse Raman Ramian mm. um, has come back. And he was incredible, you know. Yeah. And that's that's the interesting thing with Origins. There's no real specialist centers there. No. Nah. And so you've got a guy like Jesse who was touted as maybe getting a crack, but yep. you know he's come back to the Sharks now. Do you think he's someone that could have a another breakout year? I think he is. I think he was great for the Knights. A lot of people. Uh, he he. After he uh, got told you're not playing NRL anymore, up until like I think it was like eight or something rounds after, he was still third in the NRL for tackle breaks. Yep. He can create opportunities. He has a yeah. great offload. He obviously fits the shark structure better. Uh, he didn't necessarily fit that night structure too well. And I think that's because Mitchell Pierce likes to play both sides of the field, but he didn't have a consistent 5'8 partner. Mm. And Kalen Ponga's trademark step, yep. long ball, is down the left passage of play. Yep. So I think he struggled with that structure. But coming back into the Sharks, the Sharks almost have too much depth in their backs now. Yeah. Because you've got Dugan, Molotalo, Sherry, Ramian, Josh Morris, Moylan. Yeah. How do you drop someone from there? Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, you'd obviously, you'd say, I mean, I'm sure it would be whoever is the best players, but the, you know, the youngest guy is usually the guy that gets dropped. And that, unfortunately, I think that will be Mulatalo. Yeah. But I think he's got a big future. I, I think so too. It's just a matter of like, you know, Moylan, does he stay injury free? Because the thing is, people forget, Moylan, when he's injury free, is incredible. Or even last season, you pit his try assist per games he played. He averaged almost a try assist a game yep. and over one line break assist a game. Yeah, playing at fullback, that's not his primary role. Yeah, his running meters were up there with some of his best seasons at Panthers. Yeah, it's only because he's missing these games in patches, and particularly with hamstrings. Now, I'm obviously not a physio or anything, but it's pretty general knowledge that they're one of the toughest things to come back from. If you're not a hundred percent, yeah then you're not 100%. And you have to imagine there was a little bit of pressure on him to get his return sorted. Yeah, A fully healthy Matt Moylan can be the best 5'8 yeah. or potentially the best fullback. And that's the thing. Like He's not going to be 5'8", Townsend, Johnson. Johnson. So he's going to be fullback. fullback. So it's like, it's, it's really interesting to see like, you know, what, what do they do with him? You know, like what, like what do they do with their back line? It's like mm. almost too many, too many options, as you said, like, he is such a great 5'8", but yep. fullback, there's a lot of running, but you're not going to get the hit-ups that you get, say, from Dugan at fullback. Yep. He does you know, the hard hit-ups and stuff like that. So well, it's um, interesting. But yeah, with Rami, do you think that uh, do you think we could see his best year yet? Yeah, I think we will. I think him and Curtis Scott also going to the Raiders. I think they'll be the two players contesting for a blue centre position. 
if there's an injury with Travojevic or yeah. one. But the yep. issue is that at this stage, you know, it's very hard to break into that Blues team. Very, very hard to break in. Um, okay, so we go to the Broncos. Now, the Broncos are in this really tough situation where never before have they signed a guy that's 22 years old and brought him straight into the leadership group. Yeah. It's insane. Oh, well, ne- I hear your story about how it used to be. In well, it just... We never, we've never been in that position before. We've always had the, the top tier in the country yep. as leaders kind of thing. And so they're in this weird position where everyone's like, wow, look at their roster and, you know, Payne Haas and Fafita and, and everything like that. But that also is a double-edged sword because you, this, you could get these constant things of like, we've got this youth, we've got this youth. And it's mm. just like, well, mad. But what are the results? What are our results? Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, it's going to be hard to attract people to a club if you don't get results. Yeah. It doesn't matter how good, you know, your players are. So how do you think they'll go in the new year? Payne Haas, incredible. for feeder incredible. Mm. Um, Croft, I think with what was on the market, fantastic buy in the sense that like, I don't know how much he's on, but they needed someone yeah. and he seems to fit the bill. Yep. But Dearden's also really good as well. So mm. tough. What, what are your thoughts of Broncos 2020? I think without Payne Haas and David Fafita, you count Payne Haas to try against the Panthers, individual brilliance. Yep. And David Fafita, I think he had 10, 16 tackle breaks, something insane against yep. the Eels. They lose those two games without their individual X factor there. Therefore, they miss the eight. I think the Broncos last year were somewhat over-reliant on their youth, yep. which is dangerous. And you look at the team. They've got all the correct pieces to, I won't say win a premiership, but contest top eight, potentially top four. Yep. But I think they need a game-controlling halfback to sort of gel that all together. And I, I don't know if Brody Croft's that man. Yep. Purely based on the fact we haven't seen him have to be that man yeah. with Cameron Smith and Cameron Munster. He he was the halfback, but make no mistake, he was not the guy leading around that Storm team, yep. which is, is tough for him because I probably unfairly criticized him and said oh, it's probably not the best signing because we haven't seen that, but he's never had the opportunity to. Yep. Seabold was actually an assistant coach at the Storm when Brody would have been coming through. Yep. So for him to make that signing, he's obviously got huge wraps on him and then to put him straight into the leadership group in an unprecedented event for Broncos, he's got huge faith in Croft. Yeah, but it's interesting because like the thing with Croft is that when you're a structured... like Let's say he was a ball runner like Jerome Hughes is. Mm. When you're a structured half and you don't get the opportunity to, to be the structured half, yep. your, all your talent is wasted. Yeah. Whereas when you're a ball runner and you're not, not a structured half and you get thrown into that position like Jerome Hughes, you can still show your talent because you, you don't... You, you, you're not a, a structured half. The structure has been taken away from you. Mm-hmm. So I actually think he'll he'll excel. The only problem is is like the pressure that's going to come with it. You know, oh yeah. Broncos don't have a few good games. All of a sudden, it's all Brody's cross fault. Everyone will forget the fact that they limped into the eight the year before. Yeah. And so the hard thing I think will be not managing his ability. I don't think that I think that's a question at all. I think he's a really really good player. It's going to be managing the fucking external noise mm. if they have a bad start to the season. Yeah. Another big thing, I suppose, is potentially it affects the growth of um, Tom Dearden. Yeah. Because you look back to the West Tigers when they had Luke Brooks and and, um, and Mitchell Moses there. They both struggled together as young halves. Yeah. But then they've went on their separate ways. For Moses, he learned a bit of Corey Norman. For Brooks, he learned of Benji Marshall. Mm. They've had those dominant halves to sort of teach them a few things. And now you look at Brooks, back-to-back Tigers player of the year, Moses, Dalian player of the year. So if those two players together couldn't make it work as rookies... You almost rule out Dearden playing NRL whilst Croft is in the seven. It's going to be interesting to see what they do do with Dearden because he, he's an organising half. He's not a yeah. he's not a ball running half. So even O'Sullivan to an extent, he's yeah. a, he's, a, he's an organising half. Yeah, he won't be available round one because of his ACL injury. But yep. he he really looked good in that Broncos seven jersey for the games he was there. Yeah, and and the thing is, you need time as well, and that's that's the issue at the moment with the Broncos is that like. Where's he experienced in key positions? Right. Like, where Where is the experience? Like Milford may go back to fullback. He may stay at six. Yeah. But he, like, he's been so back and forth. Like mm. his experience, you don't. You, Milford's not the guy you want to look for experience. His incredible talent is what you want to look at. Like, yeah. That's what he wants to be used for. Whereas you look at say someone like the Storm, and I know I'm look, talking about one of the greatest ever, but Cameron Smith, you rely on his experience. Like, he's not going to fucking make three line breaks a game yeah. usually but his experience of guiding a team around is yep. so important you look at the Roosters Cooper Cronk yep. Kiri has won three premierships now 
Um, you look at the Raiders, you had Jared Croker, who's been in that back line for so long now. He's been through it all. Papali up front has been mm. through it all. Hodgson's been there for quite a while now. So you see these like experienced people, whereas like you look at the Broncos, you've got like, Alex Glenn at the moment. Darius, like, Alex Glenn is playing solid footy. Darius has struggled for form in the last year, so it's like... I actually think there's a big question mark whether he'll be there round one. Yeah, I mean... Um, that's, experience is invaluable, but... I don't know, especially if that thing, if it's true that if he doesn't play more than fifteen games, he doesn't get his player option. Well, if that's the, if that is true, I'm not sure if it is, but if that is true, there's no way they just won't. Yeah, um, that's just that's just footy, I that's, guess. Uh, but that's footy, really. It's a business, but I've got a psycho as my fullback for Bronx. Yep, I thought um, he looked really, really good in open space at the nines. Different game, different game formats, of course, but you know he looked he looked spectacular there. And then my six is Milford. And I know Milford is, you know, you can say he's primarily better at fullback. And I wouldn't necessarily disagree with that. But the fact is, with Brodie Croft coming in, Milford becomes the Broncos' most experienced half, whether his best position is in the halves or at fullback. Yeah. So I think you've got to have Milford there at six, especially while you help the transition with Brodie Croft coming into the club. But do you think, like, with Milford there at six, you're kind of adding pressure onto him again? You know, like in the sense that, like, you're basically going back to the problem, which is like making him the experienced half, making him, you know, make the calls. Yeah. And the blames yeah, on him. On there. You know, the blames on him if they don't go well then, because he's back at six. And why is Milford not doing this? Whereas, like, when he went back to fullback last year, he played his best footy all year easily, not even close. Yeah. So then your wings would be what Corey Oates and Asako. Yeah. Jordan Kahu, wasted in reserve grade. Yeah, he, he, well, he might be play center. I guess you got Bird and. It's going to be interesting to see what, what direction they go. Um, yeah. But yeah, so if you had to predict next year at the moment, where would you finish the Broncos at? Ninth. Ninth? I think they'll have some really good performances again, but I think it might take a few more games than people are expecting for Croft to find his feet as the lead dominant man of this young Broncos team. Well, I think that as long as there's signs that there's a foundation there to grow on, yeah, I think most they won't be happy, but they'll accept it more. Whereas I think the problem with this year with the Broncos is like, where's the future like what foundation do we have to build here right you know what I draw it all back to I think whoever owns that club is crazy they ousted potentially the greatest coach ever in Wayne Bennett and I know Seabold was great for the Rabbitohs he was a rookie year you got rid of the greatest ever coach early to bring in a coach with one year coaching experience it just didn't make sense yeah there must have been more to that because I don't the, the transition would have been so much smoother if they, yeah. he had to just stayed another year mm-hmm. and then Seabold comes up. I don't, I don't understand why that went the way it did. Like, you know, Wayne built that club. Without Wayne, yeah. Broncos don't exist. Spot on. Um, yeah, that, that whole thing was bizarre. Okay, so what about the uh, Javoyevich brothers and, and uh, six-year deal? Yep. Manly Seagulls, they went from bloody, you know, what, 14th or something like that yep. all the way to 5th or 6th. Mm-hmm. I mean, where do you see them coming into the new year, let's say Tommy stays injury-free, Jake's yep. obviously, he's always turning up. Where do you see them? Top four. Top four. And a premiership within the next five years. Really? I know people hate Manly and, you know, stuff that you can't deny. You look at Cherry Evans, Tom Travoyevich, Jake Travoyevich. Now, I know it's not the traditional, what we saw at Melbourne, one seven nine. That's a big three. That's yep. a big three capable of winning you a premiership. Yep. The issue for me will come around how they retain their talent over the next few years. Because I think uh, at least half their top 30s coming off contract, if not the end of this year, next year. And obviously those three are soaking up a large amount of the cap. Yep. Desi Azza doesn't have his famous back-end deals anymore. But um, how they retain their players will ultimately define it. But if Des Hasler is able to retain the key players he wants and unearth players like Ruben Garrick. Yep. I didn't even know who Ruben Garrick was last year. Well, he couldn't even get a run at Dragons. Yeah. Couldn't even get a run. And then he went up to Manly. And now Played he's one every of his, game. Yep, their every goal game. kicker. Yep. Arguably winger of the year. Or yep. rookie winger of the year. Yeah, one of the best wingers of the he, year. Him or Sivo, it was. Yep. It was yeah, I, I honestly think premiership in the next five years. If they wow. can keep it all together, keep the pieces he wants. Yep. No one knows what it is to be Manly more than Des Hasler. Yeah, it's true. And that was the issue with Trent Barrett. He had the excuses. The facilities weren't good enough. This wasn't good enough. This, I don't have this. 
Des Hasler just coming in, you know. He it, when I think of a sea eagle, I think of Des Hasler. Desi Hasler. He is a sea eagle through and through. Yep. He brought back the manly spirit, and you could see it in the games. Yeah, you. Could. They was they were a different team on defense this year, mm. defending their own goal line. They were, and and we're not talking about a team that just stayed injury free and got super lucky. We're no. talking about a team that decimated by injury. By round 10, 15 of their top thirty had been injured at one stage or another. Yep. Which is Crazy. Like, probably unheard of. Yep. But it didn't matter whether they played one NRL game or 100. They came in for Desi and that team and defended like their life depended on it. Yeah, absolutely. When you got that culture, well, that's the thing. could if be that, close. That's the, the culture for me is the biggest indicator yeah. in the sense of like, they have this you know fantastic culture. Everything else can be built upon around that. Mm-hmm. And also like, they with the fantastic culture, they've proved to themselves they've proven like guys we can be fully decimated by injury yeah we can still give the best teams in the comp a shake especially like semis against sharks exactly so if they can they've got that confidence going into the new year as long as they don't get rest on their laurels and you know relax yeah. or whatever and i'm sure desi wouldn't let them do that mm. they really could do you know anything what another big thing is adam Fanua blake he's still 24 years old oh, gun. he's up there as the best prop in the world right now well i i, I had a, i don't know who i was speaking to but money to, to power and Fanor Blake, mm-hmm. as a pair, not singly, are probably the best front yeah. row pairing in the game right now. For different reasons, but they both bring so much to that team. Like, if you averaged out their both their performances compared to, like, say, you know, another NRL, I'm not trying to bag anyone else, but those two together, their standard was so fucking high that, like, yeah. you look at, for example, you look at um, the Knights, Clemmer every week, incredible. Yep. Um, but, you know, his partner was Saifidi, you know, majority, yeah. what wasn't, was good, but he wasn't putting the numbers up that those two were putting up together kind of yeah. thing. Um, yeah, no, I'd, I'd agree with that. Probably next closest, Nelson and Jesse Romich. Yep, yeah, they're, they're, they're fucking next really good. Yep, but I would, I would say probably for Noel Blake and Tapao, when you just look at their stats, maybe there's other things that they're doing that I'm not mm. seeing. They would probably pairing-wise be, you know, yeah. um, two best. What about, um, this is my favorite, Parry Eels. Yeah, did you read my column from a few nights ago? Um, I'm not sure. I've written a couple about them now in the sense that like they could be building something really special. Oh, yeah. On average, they have the, the youngest spine in the comp, mm-hmm. 22.5 years old. I think there might be the Warriors that maybe, but they're not cemented spots. These are cemented spots. 22.5 years old um, on average. Joey Johns is now a half coach. Their back line is unbelievable. Their forward yep. pack, they've got Madison in now. Yep. I mean... They lose Manu Ma'u and Tepai Maroa. Yep. And they're formidable losses. We yep. can't understate that. But to bring in someone like Regan Campbell-Gillard and Ryan Madison, and this is no offense to the, the, the previous, but I think they go forward as a team with those two. Yep. I think they have made the best signings of anyone this offseason. Probably. I mean, Panthers have done all right as well. But yeah, prob- I would say the Eels have probably had the most... The, especially if you include Blake... Yeah, um, Wonga Blake from mid season. Yeah, yeah. If yep. you include him, like fuck, man. Like you look at their back line: Sivo, Jennings, Blake, Ferguson, Gutherson, Brown, Moses, Mahoney. Like if you were to look at, especially their their spine, like a young spine to build around. Mm-hmm. Fuck, you can't get much better than that. Yeah, I honestly, if, if Reed Money doesn't debut for the Maroons next year, I'll be shocked. I rate him that highly. Yep. I had him in my predicted lineup this year, and people were ask, genuinely asking, "Who's that?" Yeah, it's crazy. And I guarantee 12 months from now, they will not be asking that question. He is incredible. The fact that he came into the season with Cameron King left the club, Brad Arthur gave him a personal challenge. I want you to be an 80-minute hooker. Didn't believe he was an 80-minute hooker. He's more than an 80-minute hooker right now. um, He's still 21 as well, I think. Yeah. If they they don't re-sign him... That is a huge loss. Oh, huge loss. Massive. Especially how important hooker is these days. I think the... Maroons made a huge mistake of not bringing him into camp this this yeah. thing especially with don't get me wrong I think Ben Hunt is a great nine but you cannot expect this bloke to play seven all year and then just rock up to origin and play 80 minutes at hooker it's you're asking it's, it's, it's not fair on Hunt like no. I'm sure he would take the jersey no matter what yeah 100% but it's just, it's, I think it's unfair to him to just expect that of him and not oh, even definitely. not even plan for the future. Like how, how they didn't bring in a young hooker. It doesn't matter who it was. Just bring in a young Queensland hooker just to get him around the camp. Right. Cost you nothing. Like yeah. he would be stoked to be there. Now he's now 
he's, Marnie hasn't been in camp. We've got Turpin as well. Both, not, neither of them got brought into camp. To no. me, that's insane to me. Oh, yeah. Even um, someone like Jake Granville should have been brought in. I know he's sort just of gone a bit backwards. Bring but... him into camp. It's one extra person. Exactly. You've got the money. Just give him the experience. Yeah. Learn the plays. Meet the boys. I, it, to me, that blew my mind. I couldn't believe yeah. that Turpin, Granville, or Marnie, when we don't even have a full-time hooker. Yeah. We don't even have a full-time hooker at, at, for our... Yes, as I said... Fucking! If Hunt was playing hooker all year, I'd pick him. I think oh, he's yeah. a. I think he's a great hooker. I actually prefer him at hooker. I, I think he's a fantastic hooker. I'm not. That, so I'm not questioning his ability. What I am saying is, is you cannot expect this guy to play seven all year and then go and play eighty minutes at nine. Spot on. It's it's just insane to me. Like it, it, it seems insane, but you say like oh Ben Hunt hooker. A lot of people don't think of it like that. But if you switch the narrative, so let's say Cameron Smith playing halfback. Yeah, everyone lost their mind. That's crazy. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? And he's one of the greatest ever. Exactly. And you and we are expecting Hunt just to go. Oh yeah, sweet. He played a bit of fucking hooker off the bench for Broncos ten years ago. Yeah. Let's chuck him in Origin when we don't have the troops to do that. In the sense mm. that, like, it's not like we're bloody the eight in a row team anymore. Yeah. We're the team that is we're, on paper. We're basically the same. So any little advantage or disadvantage we have, it's going to affect the game. Whereas like in the eight in a row, you could maybe get away with it because we've got such fucking crazy. We've got the goats in like seven, six, fullback, yeah. forwards. We don't have that anymore. So I just like I just it it drives me insane that like fair enough put Hunt there this year. Fair mm-hmm. enough. Like you've even got friend as well, but to not bring a hooker into the squad is. In, it just crazy. I couldn't. Maybe there's more to. I'm sure there is way more to it, their reasonings, but like to not bring a hooker in to bring yeah. him through in such a crucial position, insane to me. Couldn't believe it. Like, yeah. Like I don't even. Yeah, it's just it does my head. Um. Um, okay, so so Parrot Eels. Where do you think they'll finish next year? What, if Parrot Eels or Manly to win a premiership next year, you only got to pick between those two. Who would you pick? Eels. The Eels. acquisition of Joey Johns is just genius. Yep. You've got someone like you know Mitchell Moses coming off half back of the year. He needs a mentor to keep him grounded, keep him focused. Yep. Who better than Joey Johns? Yep. Dylan Brown, 18 years old, already a star in the game, needs someone to keep him grounded. Who better than Joey Johns? Even to read Marty to an extent. I mean, Johns played a little bit of hooker in rep games and stuff. I'm sure he has something to offer a young 22-year-old. He would have something to offer any position on the field. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. Bringing him in, the best mid-season signings. The boys all love Brad Arthur. Gutherson, I think he's a hugely underrated captain yep. in the fact that he leads by example. Well, look at who they've been able to recruit. You don't get to recruit those kind of people unless your captain is someone. Because he's talking to them. They, yeah. they don't come to the club without Gutherson talking to them. Spot on. So, yes, the club play a huge role in recruiting. Recruitment, I get all that. But what I am saying is, is like... Mm-hmm. He would be in on every one of those meetings talking to him. And, and so his man management skills, Gutho, is huge. Yeah. He's 25 as well. Uh huh. I think forget the Seagulls versus Eels question. I'll say Eels will win the premiership. Really? They're your, they're your pick to win the premiership? Yeah, I, I was leaning with Storm. Cameron Smith's likely final year. And Jerome Hughes will have a whole season there at halfback. Yep. There's a lot of reasons to go with the Storm as well. They do have a whole uh, centre now. I think it'll be Shandor Earl and Justin Olam. Yep. Which does plug it up quite nicely. Um, but I've, I'll go with the Eels. Go with the Eels. Wow, Confident. big call. It's, the thing is, like people are like, oh, it's so far away. It's like, we understand it's so far away. We totally get that. We're just like, if we had to say now, yeah. this is what we're saying. Like, exactly. We're not going to get to round one and be like, fuck, it's definitely the Eels still. <laughs> and the, the Eels come out and get touched up. You know, So just more you know, speculation. Because the thing is, recruitments have been done, essentially. Mm. You, you only can go off the information you've got. Exactly. Roosters. Three peak, can they do it? I, I literally, I don't think they can. Really? I think wow. the mental burnout and the target on their back is going to be that huge next year that the Roosters can't afford to rock up to a game even 9 out of 10. Yep. They're going to be 10 out of 10 every game because teams aren't rocking up with the mentality of oh, reversing last year's premiers. We need to play our best. This is where we measure how good we are. They're turning up with we're reversing the first back to back premiers in however many years. Yep. We need to be 20 out of 10. Yep. And I think James Maloney spoke about it a few years ago, um, the year after run with Cronulla. He said there was just a target on our back. If we weren't perfect, the other team were able to capitalise. Small moments we would have won in the year previous, we were no longer able to do so. But haven't the Roosters already proven they can do that? Yeah, they have, but surely the mental fatigue comes in oh, after dear. winning back Maybe their back. squad is so hectic that they can do it. Look, on paper, they're probably still, if not the best team, top three. 
You know what? It will be interesting if, if Lachol does move on. You know, like they've got the strike, don't get me wrong, with Manu and, and Tedesco and Morris but, and Tupu. <laughs> Crazy. He's it's, so underrated. But yeah, he is so underrated. Um, but in saying that, Lachol has done some big game plays for them. Yeah. That if he isn't there anymore, maybe they don't have. Drop goal against Melbourne during the year. Huge, huge win for the Roosters. Yep. And then he did the gra- match winning flick pass. Yep. And he's goal kicker as well, top point scorer, all that kind of stuff. So it'd be interesting. Like people might think, oh, they'll just move on from the show. They should be fine. But it's like, oh, I don't know, man. Like he, yeah. he will be a big loss for them if he goal does. Goal kicker as well. Goal kicker as well. He goes Takiyoho goal kicks, but he's off the field for 20, 30 minutes. Yep. So you don't think they can do? Oh, I wouldn't. I would. I definitely wouldn't rule this team out. Yep. I definitely wouldn't do that. But I, they wouldn't be my favourites to win the premiership. Can well, they three Pete? Yes. Do I think they will? Probably not. Here's some something else to scare. So obviously they got Flanagan coming. Yeah. He's fantastic. Yeah. But they probably have the best player coming out of school of, yeah. the, of the in the nation, Sam Walker. Yeah. Now this guy is incredible. He's the yeah. son, I think, of Chris Walker's brother. So Chris Walker's nephew. Yep. This guy, if you've watched his highlights, he's basically you know he's a mix between Ponga and you know a fantastic half or whatever. Yeah. And so what's crazy is I'm I'm pretty sure he's still 17, so he can't play NRL until halfway through the year if he does play NRL. But when you look at like the depth with Kiri Flanagan himself, mm-hmm. they could unearth another superstar and be sitting yeah. there with a combination as good as Kronk Kiri with Kronk Walker, Kronk Flanagan. Yeah. Flanagan could still turn out to be that as well. Yeah, yeah. Even Lachlan Lamb. Well, that's what Lachlan Lamb. They've got four like. Flanagan, one of the best out of school. Then they've also picked up Walker, the best kid out of... You know what I mean? And yep. they've got Lamb as well. Yep. That's what's scary is well, like... What's scary is the man coaching them all for a couple of years as well. Yep. For me, Cooper Cronk has the best mind of any half I've ever seen. Yep. I would love a show with him and Matty Johns where they like analytically break down why players ran a certain play. Yep. That's Cooper Cronk's just a mastermind. And to yep. have him in your corner... Particularly for Kyle Flanagan. I did the stats last year. So he had a higher win percentage than Sean Johnson whilst playing in the halves alongside Chad Townsend. But all his losses were to top four teams, whereas Johnson's losses were mainly bottom eight teams. Mm. So I'm not trying to say he's a better player than Sean Johnson. I'm not making the comparison there. I'm saying when you look at it like that, there is so much potential with this kid. And you think Cooper Cronk mentoring him week in, week out. I And the pressure of a young gun underneath him as well helps heaps. Yeah, I think... Kyle Flanagan could definitely go down as buy of the year. Oh, really? Buy yeah, of the year? Yeah. Think More Ryan than Madison? Madison? Yeah, that'd probably be the next best one. Yeah. But you just wonder... Oh, first of all, I'd love to hear Ryan's side of the story, what actually went yeah, down so there. I. Yeah. But I imagine Freddie Fittler wouldn't look favourable on that given he was 18th man. But who knows? Maybe he's had the chat with Freddie. Freddie knows exactly what happened, but there's... Yep. Certainly more that went on there. Yeah, certainly more. There's no... The I've, whole, oh, the player wanted more money. Is I've the never ever... Cop like, out. look, I understand that maybe there was some of that in in it or whatever, yeah. but I have never played with a player that has walked in and said, if you don't give me more money right now, I'm out of here. It's well, never happened. Let's look at... I think with the Eels, it was reported he signed for 550. At the Tigers, he was on 450 to 500. Why would you put yourself all throughout yeah. to make 50K when if he stays with the Tigers, he probably plays Origin next year, he probably makes 90K in match payments. Yeah, I just... So there's more to it. There's got to be more to it because, like, again, I've never been in a situation. Like, I've been in a situ- Like, even... Like, for example, they're not the same. They're not even close to the same. But, like, Latrell's situation, he says, look, I just want to go on the open market and see my value. Yeah. There's that, like, as in a player going, look, Maybe I'm worth more to other clubs. Mm-hmm. Can I just wait and see? And then I'll decide. And then maybe he moves on. But I've never met a player ever in all my time that has literally gone to a club and said, yes, I did sign a three-year contract with you, but I'm worth more now. And if you mm-hmm. don't give me an upgrade, I'm walking. Like, what kind of person would you have to... You wouldn't fit in a team environment. No. If you were that selfish. Like, it does not make sense. No one would want to play with you. Why would the Eels yeah. want to sign him? If that's really what happened, why would the Eels sign him? Absolutely. And the way it all panned out with um, you know the media outlets reporting it. For me, it was, you know, you, you and I would understand this because we report on stuff every day. It was pretty obvious the Tigers leaked that information to the right people because they wanted to get that narrative out there. Well, the, the Tigers have their own personal brand to, to their business brand to protect. So they yeah. don't want to be seen as a club that let go 
potentially an origin star. Yeah. Um, and, you know, if, if the origin star didn't do anything wrong, I'm not right. saying that. That's the thing. I'm not sitting here saying Ryan Madison didn't do anything wrong. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Yeah. What I am saying is, and I agree with you, is that I'm sure there is more to the story than a bloke just rocked up one day and was like, give me more money or I'm walking. Yeah, like, particularly come with, on. around like Michael McGuire making him not go on the off season to keep training until December, stuff like that. Because Eastside Masters left the club too. Yeah. Michael Maguire is a hard ass coach. Yep. But it's just one of those things like you actually got to spe- we don't know actually know yeah, what yeah, happened. We are happen. speculating well, that's right what, now. That's well, that's the thing. That's what's frustrating is like we're speculating in a fair manner of like I'm right. sure there's more to it. The problem with a lot of the, some of the media these days is they're not speculating. They're saying yeah, Madison walked happened. in and, and and wouldn't it be great if you know, we get to a stage where a player can just use their... And we've seen it a few times this year. Yep. Players using their personal Instagram to hit back at reports. Yeah. How good would it be if Ryan Madison just put out a tweet or a photo? Yeah. Hey, guys, I'm leaving Tigers because this happened. Yeah. You know, the media won't tell you that. I want to be honest with all my fans. You know, I'm looking forward to starting a new chapter of the Eels. Yeah. Where a player could just cut the crap straight yeah, away. This is what's happening, guys. Um, so, what about the Knights, you know? What, what, what do you reckon with the Knights? They're so, it is such an enigma because their roster is fucking great. Yeah. Uh, Ponger is one of the best talents we've ever seen come through at yep. this age. He, in my opinion, he's the first internet superstar we've ever seen come into the NRL. So he was famous before he played NRL. Yeah. And so like he, he is the first true internet superstar in my opinion. Yep. Um, people, I don't think he had as bad a year as people carry on last year. No. Not even close. His first half of the year, first half of the year, it was incredible. Went through Origin. Origin is taxing. People do not understand for yeah. a young young player, especially when he's not a, a rookie coming in that's going to be eased into it. He was a rookie coming in with the whole of the state relying on him to be yeah. out to Desco. Absolutely, and I think he you know he probably played a couple games at fullback before Origin because there was that whole 5-8 sort of trial thing. I which... feel like I was one of the only ones that was like, I do not agree with this move to six. Like, what are you talking about? He's oh, literally... Darren, Darren Lockyer did it. And it's like, come on, guys. He's the best or one of the best ever. He did it six ever. years into his career. Yeah. There's a complete difference there. In a team that was one of the best yep. teams in the comp with yeah. one of the greatest coaches ever. Yeah. As good as KP is, there is no comparison to the switch Lockyer made. Well, not yet. And like, there probably never will be someone that you can compare that to again. Well, there's there's just like... The thing is as well, is like not yet. Like maybe yep. he'd been playing fullback for one year. For yeah. one, one full year, I'm pretty sure. It was one year, wasn't it? Yeah. We played a couple of games at Cows on the wing and yeah, stuff but, like that. But one proper yeah, full year. Full year at fullback was already... Probably would have won Dally M if he didn't get injured. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think he would have. And... You take that guy and you put him at six. That's crazy to me. Now, look, I know you know Brown must have had his reasons or whatever. So I'm not you know trying to have a dig at Brown. Like this is just my opinion on the situation. But to put him at six, mm. and then people are like, oh, Ponga said that it was sweet. Of course, Ponga said it was sweet. He's not going to come out and say I don't want to play six and I'm fucking off the coach for putting me there. Yeah. He goes back to fullback and in the first three games. He has like fucking four or five line breaks. One of the like kills it. And I just think like we we don't actually pay attention to how much coaches' decisions affect players. Like, yeah. for example, how do we know that the damage on his body, because this one of my big issues was this, he is a young body. Why put him in the front line, tackling and shit? Obviously going to be targeted. Obviously going to be targeted. How do we know that the, the fatigue from the start of the season, plus the crazy origin, didn't hit him at the end of the season where he was like, whoa, man, he's his second year in the NRL, yeah. and he's playing six already mm-hmm. in a team that they're hoping to make the eight this year, yeah. and then he gets chucked at fullback. What were your thoughts on the whole situation? Oh, just crazy. Just crazy to think that, you know, he, he could go to six one year into his career. Could he have done it? Yeah, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And I just thought that that was a little bit too risky for Nathan Brown. Maybe, because obviously he was mutually agreed to leave the club, which I think was probably more of a tap on the shoulder. Yep. Maybe he thought he had to do something drastic and try something to just get it, I don't know, try to save his job. Maybe he knew before that year, if I don't make the eight, I'm out. Yep. And he thought, I've got to try this with Kalen. But I don't know. For the Knights, they definitely do need to find a consistent six. Yep. It's not Kalen Ponga, but they do need to find a six. And I believe it's Connor Watson. A role-playing six? Not necessarily a six that plays both sides of the field. Because we've seen with the Eels, you have Mitchell Moses run both sides. Dylan Brown runs the left edge with Sean Lane outside him. Michael Jennings make a Sebo. One yep. of the most devastating left edges in the comp. And there's no reason why the Knights can't do that with Pierce. He runs both sides. Connor Watson sticks to his corridor and attacks very well down that. 
they do need to find a consistent mix because I don't think it's any coincidence. When you look at the Knights last year, when they were on fire, Mitchell Pierce was on fire. He was, I think, what was it, five or six men in matches in a row? Yep. And then when you look when the Knights were poor, it's not that necessarily Mitchell Pierce was poor, but he just wasn't able to create those opportunities from the pressure the defensive line was putting on him. Yep. And if he has a consistent six outside him, then I think that's going to alleviate a ton of pressure, allow him to effectively play both, play both sides of the field. And as soon as he does that, like you think Connor Watson, Kalen Ponga, um, Jaimel Hunt on that left edge, like that is a recipe for disaster for defenders. Yeah, I just think with they just need to basically go, Mitch, it's your team. You, you call all the shots. In attacking yep. play, you call all the shots. Connor Watson at six, and, and you just say, Connor, whatever Mitch says, do it. Mm-hmm. And if you get if you see some eyes up footy, you you play it. But at the end of the day, just just do what like because like you look at Dylan Brown's year, he basically did that. He was just yeah. like whatever Mitchell Moses said, he did it, and that's what works so well for him. So I agree. I think I think they got the players there. It's, I think Braley's a fantastic signing for them. Definitely, because he's so yeah. centered. You know what you're going to get, yep. and he's going to get the ball to Pierce as well. He's not like a hooker that's going to wig out and be like, oh shit, shit what? he's going to get the ball to Pierce. Yeah. So if if they're going to finish, where do you think they're going to finish next year? Will they make the eight? I'd like to see them make the eight, but it, you know we saw Anthony Seabold come into the Broncos last year with really specific and strict structure and sets for tackle. You need to be hitting this point of the field. Yep. We need to get the ball out to this person here. And I think if O'Brien comes in and over restricts the style of play for the Knights, then there could be issues there, like the Broncos teething issues. But yep. If O'Brien can come in with a simple game plan that can be followed by their spine of Braley, Ponga, Pierce, and you assume Watson, I could see them definitely making the eight. Yep. I think it was you talking about it a while ago. The fact we're even talking about making the, the Knights making the eight and we're upset they missed it, given where they were two or three years ago, is absurd. Yeah, yeah well, that's, that's the thing. Like, I think this year they should they have the squad to make the eight. Definitely. But I think, yeah, last year, it's like, well, you've got to remember, guys, like two years ago, they were yeah. like unbelievably bad, whereas now we're like angry they didn't miss it. So I guess, you know, don't rest on that that sentiment of like a silver lining, you yeah. know, we shouldn't. But in saying that, like, look, progression is progression. And, we, you know, it's, Knights are moving forward. Mm. This year will be this. I even said it a lot last year. I said it's not, it's not about this year. It's about the fact they got Ponga. They got Pierce and Clemmer. They can recruit now, so recruiting is not an issue. Yeah. It's about the next two or three years after that. Um, so the Raiders going forward, yeah, what do you reckon? Recruited really well, definitely. Like their recruitment is maybe as good as the Eels with uh, Scott and uh, Williams. Yep. yep. Interesting thing though is like Williams is a looks like a ball running half, so it's going to be he interesting is. how they. You know, Whiten's not. He's not a structured half. He's a ball yeah. running half also. So that's going to be really interesting how they work that. What do you think is going to happen with the Raiders next year? Really, I think anything less than top four is upsetting for them. But when you go back through and you look at the previous years, they haven't made back-to-back NRL finals appearances since 2005. Mm. Think of 2016. They were like fantastic. And then was it 2017? They missed. They, they missed both, I'm pretty sure, yeah. in 18 as well. So they statistically and history would show us they haven't got a good run of consistently making the eight. The thing is, though, when you make the eight, you want to change your style of play slightly like the Roosters did this year. They slightly changed their methods of attack, yep. but you don't want to have a massive change. And I think George Williams coming in, like you said, he's a ball running half. It's good in a way because changing halfback undoubtedly certainly changes your attack to some extent. But with two ball running halves, and I think George Williams was third in the Super League for run meters. So he, oh, wow. I mean, he's definitely a ball running half. And he had a, a lot of good try assists. So he definitely does have a strong passing game. But I ultimately think removing Caesar could could be a big error but then you look when Caesar was injured last year Sam Williams who they just re-signed for two years came in and did a fine dandy job so there's no reason he can't do that again Yeah. anything less than top four is a failure for me for this Raiders team they have on paper Yep. what happens with BJ Lailua is interesting for me Yep. there's talk move him to a back rower now Coming off his neck injury, I don't think that is the best move for BJ. That, I mean, the neck injury could have ended his career. Yep. So coming in with more workload, I don't think that's the best thing to do for him. Yep. But at the same time, you don't sign Curtis Scott and put him on the wing and make Kotrick or Simmonson miss out. No, no. He has to be center. Yep. And if he has to be center, 
It's not left center because yeah. you're not taking Jared Croker out. Maybe you put BJ on the bench and bring him on for 20 minutes going crazy. Potentially. Just, I mean, they did that last year with Bailey Simonson, so yep. there's no reason why they can't use BJ in that role. But it is a lot of money on the bench, cap-wise. Cap yeah. I would say the Bulldogs were previously interested in him. Yep. I wouldn't be absolutely surprised if they made a play at him yep. and said, look, you know, this could be the situation for you. We can offer you a consistent starting role. Yep. And I wouldn't even rule out the Tigers. They seem interested in the outside backs, and they just got his younger brother. Yep. That's true. That's true. I think it's um yeah the Raiders are interesting because it, they're it's a huge play bringing bringing Williams two boring halves. We've seen it time and time again. It just doesn't work. No. So again, it from from a caliber of player, it's a huge signing when it, how good he can be. Yeah. But from the style of player, it's interesting to see what they're going to do with him. You know, Absolutely. at first I thought maybe they'll move Chance to Chance to center, right, and put him at fullback. But then I was like, well, obviously not anymore because they bought Scott. So they must he must be the seven that they're going to go forward. Yeah. And maybe there's a way they're going to... Maybe they're going to give more responsibility to Hodgson to, to move the, the boys around. But Hodgson yeah. reminds me. He's coming into his own. He reminds me a lot of Cam Smith now. Yeah, he does. Definitely. Making him captain was so smart because Absolutely. he runs that team so well. And it's not like, you know, we sit here and say, oh, you can't get away with two ball running halves. Theoretically, the Storm did do it with Cameron Smith last year with Hughes and Munster. Yeah, that's they true. They have shown an ability to do but, it to some Mun- extent. Munster is literally one of the best players in the game. And right. Cameron Smith is the greatest hooker of all time. Right. And so, Josh yeah. Hodgson, for me, he's probably just under Cam Smith. Well, and Jack Whiten, just under Munster. Yeah, well, but Whiten's had one year. You know, like, like right. for example, and Hodgson's had, like, he's really good, but Smith level good? Shit, I don't no. know. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be interesting to see. And also, he, he has had some injuries as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and it'd be interesting. I think they'll. I think they'll definitely be top six. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think they they'll be hoping for a top three finish. Um, but yeah, they're, I love following the Raiders. Bunch of great blokes. Johnny Bateman, love him, big Johnny. Johnny. Um, all right. So we. What? Is, I mean, this talk about an enigma. Penrith Panthers. Mm. <laughs> talk like two years ago they were the. Sh- next they were big set thing. for a premiership. And now it's like. Fuck! Like I don't even know. Like, I, and this is again no knock on the boys. It's more like I, you, you guys have got such a hectic roster. Mm. Like I honestly don't know. I've got no idea. Well, three years in a row they got eliminated at the exact same point in the finals. Yeah. Some stage that's got to have a bit of a mental fatigue. Like, oh, not again. Like we're not improving. Yeah. But then I think last year, and as Mitch Kenny was great when he came in hooker, but I thought they really lacked a dominant hooker. And they've signed Appy Corusel, who we know from his time at Manly, is a dominant hooker. Yeah, great hooker. Just like you were saying with Jaden Bradley with the Knights, making yeah. an immediate impact, Corusel will make an immediate impact on this team. Yeah. For me, the biggest question mark, and I know we shouldn't have question marks over a 22-year-old who's only ever missed the finals once and has just won back-to-back origin appearances, Cleary. But the biggest question mark is how does he handle being the sole man? Because yeah. when he did his MCL injury, I believe it was 2018, James Maloney took over the team. They didn't lose a step. But when James Maloney's been out injured, Cleary has struggled to be that dominant half, the main controller. So there's a huge question mark there. Yep. Um, as good as Jerome Lua is at 5'8", I believe they have said they'll go with him. He is a ball-running half. He yep. will not realistically be able to help Cleary manage that team. And I think Cleary's definitely capable of it. I would not sit here and tell you he's not after the things he's done in our game at still 22 years of age. Well, he honestly reminds me, and I'm not saying he's as good as this person so let's just relax he reminds me of Kronk right stable gets the job done kicking great game great kicking game great kicking game great defence he's only 22 years old was Kronk playing that good when he was 22 years old I don't I think so he was still a hooker when he was 22 that's, that's what I'm saying so yeah. like we've got to remember this guy is so young as a half with this enormous pressure and like when he played Origin like he did his job and mm. that's what that's what you get with Cleary you, you're going to get a guy that's a fantastic kicker um, convert, he converts as well, doesn't he? Right. Great defender, like one of the best defenders in the game as as a half. And so I just think like if they the, the key won't be the talent that he has because he has unbelievable talent. The key will be finding that right balance between him and his six and his fullback. Yeah. That's the key. It's not it, it's it's about the, the the partnerships. You know, you look at like Moses and, and Norman, both individually brilliant, like incredible, mm. but just their click wasn't there. No. And it's it's similar with Cleary. He's got a, if he can find that click with his partner, I think he'll be fantastic. Now it's right. just a matter of who's going to be fullback. It's going to be Edwards or yeah, you know, like who, what what direction they're going to go. It's going to be really interesting to see um, 
yeah, what direction they go. But yeah, Pan- Panthers are just an interesting one because, as we've said, like, fucking... There's no reason why they should have gone backwards oh, this year. man, absolutely not. Absolutely, especially with Maloney, absolute winner. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it should be it should be interesting to see how they go next year. If you've got to predict where they're going to finish, where they're going to finish. I'd say they miss the eight again, just what, until they adjust to life without James Maloney. Yep. He has been so influential on their attack, their structure, his short kicking game, getting them repeat sets. To lose a player of his calibre, I, th- I think James Maloney, for me, he's the best 5'8 I've seen since Darren Lockyer. Yep. I feel pretty comfortable saying that. Yep. And, you know, you lose a player like that, I think you you just have to go backwards to some extent. That's true. That's true. But in saying that, like, you look at the way they went last year, it's like, fuck, you know, how do they go backwards from that when they probably should have yeah. been top six? Um, They've recruited well too. Kirk Capo and Zane Tedavano. Yeah, good recruits. Really good recruits. Yeah. I think they've got the squad to be top four even, to be honest. Oh, def- I, look, I wouldn't be shocked if they made the top eight. Yeah, I mean... Not at all. Rabbitohs. Was yeah. Wayne's first year a success or not? Oh, well, you can't really say it was unsuccessful when you make the preliminaries, but it was disappointing in the fact that they got eliminated in the preliminaries two years in a row. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it was a massive success because yeah. you had Greg Inglis, the greatest back outside back of all time, period. Yeah. He On his day, there's no outside back better. I don't care what anyone says. Like. No. You put even even Jared Hayne, like you put Greg Inglis on his best day. He, I think, I'd pick, I'm picking Greg Inglis, even though I think Jared Hayne's incredible. Yeah. Um, they just brothers. So you, you've got Greg Inglis, yep. forced retirement. That's a million dollars in your cap gone. Sammy Burgess is playing on fucking one shoulder the whole year. He's your mate. That's another million dollars gone. All right. All the injuries, all the injuries he had. Way more than the year before, mm-hmm. and he still he won more games, and he got to the like. Against the Raiders, they were literally one try. Like, Cody Walker scores that try and Hodgson doesn't rip it out. Yeah. Like, the, the Rabbitohs dominated that game. Yeah, they were the um, better team. They were the better side for most of the game. Raiders just found a way to get it done. Uh, I think it was a... For what they had to deal with that yeah. year, people... Like, and he didn't make a big deal out of it. That's the key. Like, he didn't talk about it much at all. But Burgess was out quite a lot. Yeah. Um, dealing with a shoulder pretty much gone. Their outside backs, they, they didn't even have a fullback most of the year. Um, Johnston was injured as well. Johnston was injured most of the year. George Burgess, 13 week suspension. So you look at like the players that they lost and the pressure that he was under to, to deliver. Mm. I would say it was a success. Yeah, well, you've actually, like, you just completely put it perfectly into words. And <laughs> now you've said that, I'm, yeah, 100% massively successful. You look at players like Junior Totola as well, doubled his average meters, yep. upped his tackle count. Cameron Murray, the bloke. Cameron Murray. I, Went he, to a whole other level. Oh, definitely. Yep. He got the best out of every player in that team, and it didn't matter whether they had one NRL game or 300 like John Sutton. Yep. He got the best out of them week in, week out. Yep. The question mark for me comes over their back row next year. Yep. Because we have players like John Sutton and Sam Burgess retiring. And whilst they do have still a formidable back row pairing of Jaden Sewer and Ethan Lowe, Samoa International, Queensland, Interna- uh, Queensland rep player, the only depth player they have in the back row with NRL experience is Bailey, uh, Bailey Sirenen. Yep. That's, you know, you come to origin time. Oh, yeah. Can I lose Cook? Yeah, I, I agree. And that's why, you know, Jai Arrow to the Rabbitohs. Please, no. <laughs> it makes more sense every day. Like, it you does. know. Look, look, the fact Bennett's come out and publicly said it as well. How often does he miss his man? Well, and also, like, you, okay, you dry arrow, all right? You've been at the Titans, slaving away. It's a tough club to play for. Haven't had the results. Mm. Huge turnover. You get offered the same or more because the reports, and again, we let's not go, like, this. that's just within reason in the sense that, like, they're saying that, Rabbitohs are offering him 800k. Yeah, they're saying the Titans offered him 750. That's what they're saying. So let's just say they're even. Let's yep. just put them at about the same. If you're an Origin player, potential international, do you go to one of the most historic clubs in the country with mm-hmm. one of the greatest co- coaches of all time, or do you stay at a Titans where they might not even be in a comp in ten years' time? Yeah. I think a lot of it will depend on how we go this year. Yep. To how Justin Holbrook comes well, you in. Well, you don't think that they could release him early and bring the troll early? Nah, I don't think Hol- I don't think we'd do that. I, I've um, I had like I was really lucky last time when I home I got to meet a lot of our board and two of the facilities and speak to our executive chairman and stuff. And I, I don't think the club would do that. I, I know that they definitely want to keep Chai Arrow. Yep. That when I spoke to them last year, that was their absolute priority: Brimo and Arrow. 
Well, Arrow to me is one of the best players in the game, in my opinion. Oh yeah, he's and a he gun. is a workhorse. Oh man, like, absolute workhorse, yeah. and he's you're going to get it every game. He's going to yeah. do it every game. So if you had to choose, I mean, not just to choose because obviously you're a Titans fan, you want him at the Titans. Yeah. But can you see him when you put all of those cards on the table? You got the Titans. Maybe they turn things around. They win a grand final, and it's fucking the fairy tale is complete. Maybe that happens. <laughs> you know, but maybe that happens. But then you've got the the certainty of like. What yeah. we do know is the Rabbitohs are going to be solid for at least another year or two, and mm-hmm. they're one of the biggest clubs, historic clubs in the you know NRL, and they could win a premiership next year, literally. Yeah, I think it will depend on his relationship with Wayne uh, with Wayne Bennett because they were at the Broncos together, and Jai Arrow did leave for the Titans because for reasons or not he wasn't getting the op- game time and the well, opportunities Wayne said to him like there's, there's, so they had Corey Parker Sam Thiday Matt Gillette Alex Glenn yeah. Jared Wallace I think had left the year before and he was still young then so he Wayne basically said to him this is what Wayne has said he said look you, yeah. you, you're you a first grader but there's just not going to be that much opportunity here same thing he said to Ash Taylor you should go to the Titans or wherever you can go to play first grade because you are a first play, grade player but yeah. you're just not here at the moment and assuming that I would 100% believe that because he said the same thing to Taylor when he was yep. behind Milford and Hunt Yep. so you have to assume Wayne Bennett said that and therefore you'd have to assume they have a pretty good relationship when you put it all together look Jai keeps coming out and saying I'm waiting for my manager to do it. Uh, my preference is to stay at the Titans. But as a Titans fan, all I want to hear him is come out and say, yeah. I'm staying yeah, yeah. with a full stop after it. I'm staying. No buts, no ifs, no yeah. waitings. Which, when you put it all together and you remove the Titans bias, it's obviously within me. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, I've had, I did an interview with Jai, was it, um, maybe like a year ago, and I full said to him after we stopped the interview, I'm like, Dude, I fucking love you. Like, you just <laughs> fucking go all day. I was like, if you ever leave, I couldn't be upset, mate, because you just do that much work for us. Yep. And he's just this humble dude. Just, yep. oh, no, nah, just do it for the team. Yeah, <laughs> nah. thinking, just well, I hope he does stay because he's key. If they lose Arrow... I've said it. If we lose Arrow, we go back half a decade. Maybe I'm exaggerating, but... Well, you look at the squad. Imagine How that's... How do you imagine, plug the hole yeah, imagine, 200 meters and 40 tackles per game? Imagine that side without Arrow in it. We would have won the wooden... S- oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's an origin rep. Yeah. Like a current... Or- future Is he Queensland- only origin rep now? Well, Wallace did get dropped, didn't he? He got so dropped in game three. He might be back, who knows. But he's a future Queensland captain. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. He no, leads no, by example. Yeah. So, anyway, bro. I think that's uh, everything we can cover for now. I'm sure we can cover more in a few weeks. But yeah, uh, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Clarky's Rugby League column. Everyone already knows that it follows yeah. my page. They all follow your page. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming on and I'll uh, get this out pretty soon. Thanks, brother. I really appreciate it. Boom. Just a bloke in a bar.